Amen. You may be seated. I always like saying you may be seated. I feel like I'm in control of something. <laughs> now you may stand up. <laughs> oh, didn't work. I guess I'm not. Well, today we wrap up our sermon series, Next Steps. We've had a four-week series on next, and we built that sermon based off of the idea that we find in 1 Peter 2.21. If you don't have a Bible, let me encourage you, there's a Bible underneath the seat somewhere in front of you. If you don't own one, if you don't have one, take it home. If somebody tries to stop you, hit them in the head with it. We want you to have that Bible. Put your name in it. Take it with you. And there's a very good reason why we want you to have that Bible. We want you to read it because we believe that if you read the Bible, God's Word will change your life. Watch. Check it out. How many of you, how many of you have had your life changed by Scripture? Raise your hand. See, that's what we believe, and so we want you to experience that as well. So if you, if you don't own a Bible, take a Bible. We're going to be on page 1204 for our first part, 1 Peter 2.21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. These are words written by the Apostle Peter to a people who had never met Jesus, yet Peter is telling them to follow in his steps. He speaks the same thing to us today. We have been left an example. The example is Jesus, and our responsibility is to follow him into the next. You're next in retirement, follow Jesus. You're next in marriage, follow Jesus. You're next in evangelism, follow Jesus. You're next in family life, follow Jesus. See, you've been called to do something. You've been called to take action and move forward following Jesus. So we want to encourage you to follow him. We've, we've asked over the last three weeks if you have taken a next step in evangelism. Those three unchurched friends that we're, we're asking you to invite between now and Easter. We've got two weeks left if you haven't done it yet. We want to encourage you to do that. Why? Because they're going to hear the life-changing message of the gospel. Their life may be changed, and that may cause a ripple effect for all eternity throughout our world. There are people that need to hear about Jesus. Have you taken the next step in serving? Why? Well, we serve. We're the body of Christ. We love. We want other people to experience the same thing that we've experienced. Are you serving as you ought to? Have you taken the next step in giving and in generosity, as Pastor Chad talked about last week? And then finally, we wrap it up talking about the next step in family. This morning, we're going to ask the question, what is your next step in following Jesus in regard to your family? How is God leading you to follow Jesus? Uh, I confess that this morning, I'm going to be leaning hard into the role of the father in the family. After I became a follower of Jesus in 1991, I began to wonder, uh, okay, Jesus has saved me. I'm born again. I've, I've received forgiveness. But when I become a dad, am I going to be the same way that my dad was to me? My dad was an alcoholic. My dad abused me. There was a lot of violence and there was a lot of fear and controlling and manipulation in our house. God, am I going to parent like that? Well, I can tell you, I could have experienced life change then and accepted Christ as Savior and never read God's word about what God desires for me to be, the man of God that God desires for me to be. So God's word does change us. God's word does keep us close to him. So uh, I'm going to lean hard onto, into the lives of the dads this morning. Um, I believe that so goes the life of the dad, so goes the life of the family. You know, I lived with my mom and my dad until I turned 13. Then I lived with my single mom for a period of time. And then I lived with my grandmother throughout my high school years. So there are many of you that play that role of dad to a child or to a grandchild. Some of you are single moms and you're playing that dual role. Some of you are a grandparent and you're playing a, a difficult role where all you wanted to do and all you ever dreamed about as a grandparent was just 
giving the candy and giving the cuddles and, and encouraging and laughing, but now you're raising them and you got to provide the discipline. Can I just tell you, I appreciate all of your sacrifice and all of your hard work. I know what my grandmother gave up so that I could uh, be raised in her house with her for four years of my life. She sacrificed. She couldn't be the grandmother. She couldn't be the nana. She had to be the one that shook the fist at me and threatened me to do my homework and things like that. So if you're a grandparent raising your kids or if you're a relative raising your kids, thank you. And though I'll be leaning into the role of the dad, if you feel it's appropriate to place yourself there because of the role that God has you playing in the life of your child or grandchild now, then certainly by all means replace uh, the dad in the notes with yourself, with your role, with how you're doing. So I'd like to ask you a question Lift your hand or raise your hand if you were predominantly raised by a single parent. Would you raise your hand if you were raised by a single parent? All right, thank you. Uh, put your hand down. See, control. Lift your hand if you were raised by your grandparent. If your grandparent predominantly raised you in, in, in life, raise your hand. Okay, more hands. Lift your hand if you uh, raised or are presently raising your children as a single parent. If you're a single parent and you're raising your kids, man, God bless you. Uh, lift your hand if you are a grandparent raising your grandchildren. Man, God bless you guys so much. Raise your hand if you were raised by a pack of wild coyotes on the edge of town. <laughs> there we go. I believe that each and every one of us that raised our hands as I'm, as I'm speaking and as I'm preaching this morning, you will agree that what I say this morning needs to be said. Whether you're a single mom or a single dad, you will agree with me that what I say this morning needs to be said. A couple years ago, a group of friends uh, in Washington State placed an ad on Craigslist. How many of you have placed an ad on Craigslist? Who am I talking to? All right, you guys know what Craigslist is. All right, so the title for the ad was Needed generic father figure for backyard barbecue listen to the ad we will be throwing a backyard barbecue on june 17th to celebrate we range in age from 21 to 26 and while most of us know how to operate a grill none of us are prepared to fill the role of barbecue dad that being said we are in need of a generic father figure from 4 p.m to about 8 p.m though you may stay the full duration of the party duties include grilling hamburgers and hot dogs whilst drinking beer bringing your own grill though this is subject to change we will provide all the meat refer to all attendees as big guy chief sport champ all while drinking beer uh, talk about dad things like lawnmowers, building your own deck, Jimmy Buffett. Funny anecdotes are highly encouraged all while drinking beer. The desired experience, a minimum of 18 years experience as a father, a minimum of 10 years grilling experience, and an appreciation of a nice cold beer on a hot summer day. We can't pay you in money, but we can give you all the food and cold beer your heart desires. Grill for a few hours, then sit back and crack open a few cold ones with the boys. This is a real ad. Do not hesitate to call if you are interested. Preference will be given to applicants named Bill, Randy, or Dave. Now, and we look at this ad and we laugh, but it's actually a real story, and you could probably Google and find out the rest of the story. But did you catch what the emphasis of the ad was on? Beer. Yeah, right? Beer drinking, meat grilling, belly scratching, champ and sport nicknames, discussion about lawnmowers and funny anecdotes. You know, as I read that ad, I'm convinced that that ad reflects that the current culture has eroded the importance and value of a dad. Since Al Bundy came onto the scene and was introduced to America in the 1980s, we've been told, you guys know who Al Bundy is? Okay. We have been told that the dad is nothing more than an awkward presence in the house. That dads are supposed to drink beer, grill food, sleep on the recliner, and tell dad jokes. But that's not who God created the dad to be. But we've come to accept this idea that that's what a dad is. That is what a father figure does. 
Paul described how the family ought to look. And when he described how the family ought to look, he described more than what the culture said a dad was. Instead, he said this is what a dad should look like within the context of a family. And on page 1162 in Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, Paul writes this. He said, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, in order for us to fully appreciate this passage, we've got to understand who Paul was speaking to and who he was addressing. And we must understand how the culture of the time viewed the role of children and viewed the role of father, because this is counterculture what Paul was speaking. He wrote this letter to Christians in Ephesus around 60 AD when following Jesus was new. Christianity was new, and Paul was writing to a people who had never, uh, weren't Jewish. He was writing to a people that didn't come out of the Jewish religion. They didn't know who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. They didn't know who David was and Bathsheba. They didn't know those stories of, of Solomon. All they knew was that they had given their life to Jesus. They had experienced life change. They had been forgiven for their sins. And God had invaded their hearts and filled their hearts with love. That is all they knew. They had no biblical context for the role of family at all. To these believers in Ephesus, Paul's words were countercultural to what they faced. They were coming out of a darkness that truly overshadowed family. In Roman family law, at the time of this writing, a Roman father had absolute power and authority over his family. How many of us would like that? He could sell them as slaves. If he wanted to, he could sell his wife, he could sell his daughters, he could sell his children as slaves, he could make them work in the field in chains, he could punish them as he liked, and even the father could inflict the death penalty if he so desired, and there would be no repercussion from the Roman law and Roman authority. Furthermore, the power of the Roman father extended over the child's whole life as long as the father was alive. That means there was no coming of age for the son. As long as daddy was alive, he might be 150 years old, he still ruled the roost. And you couldn't do anything that your father did not approve of. The father had complete and total control. The Roman child was always under the authority of the father. When a child was born, the child would be born and he would be brought to the father's feet and laid down. If the father stooped down, picked up the baby and held it, it was a sign that he accepted the baby as his own and that he was going to raise it as his own. But if the baby was laid down at his father's feet and his father chose to reject it and not accept the gift or not accept the baby, he wouldn't pick it up, he'd turn his back, they would then take the baby to the city square where whoever wanted the baby could come by and pick up the child. Unwanted children were commonly left in the city square, whether they were babies or whether they were growing up. They were left there to be picked up, and if you ran a slave business, you would take that child home with you, fatten them up, sell them off as a slave. If you ran a brothel, you would walk by, pick up the girls, and train them to be prostitutes. That was a life that Paul spoke into. That was the culture of darkness that Paul spoke into. Do you think that sounds bad? It gets worse. This culture was so merciless that even special needs babies experienced something as well. Seneca, a Roman philosopher of this time, wrote this. He said, we slaughter a fierce ox, we strangle a mad dog, We plunge the knife into sickly cattle. Children who are born weakly, we drown. So they would take babies who were born, who were special needs, and just drown them. Paul spoke life into this dark culture. 
in Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, when, when Paul said, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, he was speaking into this culture. When Paul said, children, obey your parents, he was speaking into this culture. Don't obey your parents because your dad's a bully. Obey your parents as you would the Lord. Paul speaking directly into the culture. The fathers were selfish and they were controlling. They were emotionless and they were always viewed right in how they treated their family. In today's culture, how would Paul speak today? What would he say? Well, I believe that one of the things that Paul would address is that the father has lost value in the culture. That we're being told that the father's role can easily be filled by somebody else. That two mommies are as good for a child as a mommy and a daddy. Or we're being told that two daddies can raise a child as wonderfully as a mom and a dad. See, the whole culture of family is broken today. Do you know that there are nearly 18,000 children in foster care right now in the state of Arizona? 18,000 children in the state of Arizona have no mommy and no daddy. They are in foster care. Do you know that in the United States of America right now today, there are 480,000 children in foster care? No mom or no dad. It's as though they've turned their back on that child and walked the other way, leaving the government to take care of them. Families are broken today. And many families are broken because dad is completely out of the picture. Dads, I, I want you to understand something this weekend. A dad's presence matters. Did you know that? Listen to some of these statistics. That boys who grew up in homes without fathers are twice as likely to end up in jail. That 63% of teen suicides are from fatherless homes. That 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. Boys who grew up in fatherless homes are more likely to have trouble establishing appropriate gender identity. That criminal activity doubles for those raised in fatherless homes. That 90% of all homeless and runaway children on the streets today are from fatherless homes homes and that 85 percent of all youths in juvenile prison come from fatherless homes a father matters and his presence in their child's life matters these statistics are not coincidental a father's presence in his home has significant meaning to the family to the children and to the spouse so so dad's we need to be there. We need to be there for our children. If a dad's presence matters, we need to be there. Be present at practices. Be present at school plays, even though they're so hard. <laughs> Especially when your kid doesn't have lines and you're, they're the tree and it's hard. <laughs> but be present there. Be present at the homework table. Eat with your family at the table. Don't sit in front of the TV. Your presence in their lives are, is significant. You matter to your wife. You matter to your kids. In fact, you are the glue that your family needs. So suck it up, right? So be the dad that your family needs. It may not be convenient. We may get tired. We may get worn out at times, but we must be there because our children need us to be that glue that gives them stability and points them in the right direction in life. Not only does a father's presence matter, but Paul writes that how a father treats his child matters as well. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So commit to godly instruction, dads. Commit to godly instruction, mom. Commit to godly instructions, grandparents. Whoever is raising the child, commit to godly instruction. Uh, let me tell you how I blew that this past weekend. Not yesterday, but the, day, the weekend before. 
So last weekend we were on the soccer field and we spent a lot of our time on the soccer field lately. Uh, Violet did not want to play. You guys have all heard the story of Violet before, right? Violet did not want to play. And when Violet doesn't want to play, she will look at the ball and she will follow it and she'll take four steps here when it's 75 yards away and she'll go this way four steps and she'll just drip, poof, dig her feet in the dirt and cleats that we spent a lot of money on that she's just grinding in the dirt. She's just standing there not wanting to play and being stubborn. So me being the dad, the coach, right? I'm, I'm the dad. I'm watching from the sidelines. So I, I say in my big dad loud voice three words of encouragement, Violet, play hard. It was like the field grew silent, right? So quiet, Violet stopped, turned, and said, No! <laughs> so, now all the eyes are on the new pastor in town. How's he going to handle this? So I, I kind of go up to the edge of the, the field, and I just looked at her and I said, Whooping! Right? Her eyes went... She became the fastest person on the field after that. I mean, she ran down the field, and she's following. She didn't get any kicks on the ball in, but she's following the ball, and she's running with them. Here's where I failed. I did not sit down and tell her, Violet, this is why it's important that you work hard. This is why it's important that you play hard. Not because Dad wants a superstar, but because God wants you to do your best in everything that you attempt to do. That you don't have to be as good as everybody else. God just wants you to do your best. Why is that, Dad? Because Romans 12 tells us that we are to be living sacrifices. And as followers of Jesus, we want to do our best in everything that we do. Because we are a pleasing sacrifice to God. I failed at that. I provided her with Jolie instruction or Dad instruction. And I didn't provide her with Godly instruction. God speaks about how parents are to handle his instructions for life in regard to their children. He instructed the people in Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, 19, teach these instructions to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, when you are walking by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. See, following the Lord is not about only about doing right. It's about verbalizing right. As we are raising children, we must be verbal. We must be verbal about our relationship with God. We must be verbal about how God changed us. We must be verbal about what we're learning from his word and pass along his instruction because his word is far more important than mine. And the way that we were raised and the sayings that our parents had, none of that is as important as raising our children to follow his instruction. And when it comes to taking that next step with our children, there are a couple of cautions to avoid, parents. Number one, avoid training your children to become like you. Trust me, your kids know this. There is enough of you around. We, we've got to avoid training our kids to become like us. We should not seek to make them like us. We should not seek to live out our failed childhood in the life of our children. If you didn't make the captain of the football team, don't be push, putting pressure on your child to make that because you somehow didn't make it. You feel like you get a second chance at living again. That's, that's not why God gave us children. God didn't give us children so that we can relive our lives through them. God gave us children to point them to him and give them his instruction. Make them more like Jesus, not like us. God has created them to be different. Observe their natural likes. What are their desires? What do they want to do? Help them become the person that God has wired them to be. He has given them a unique personality. And your role as a parent is to figure it out Figure out where their interests are, get them involved in lots of different things, and then let them go crazy and you support them in, how, in what they're interested in doing. The second caution is this. Avoid training children to simply be good. Avoid training children and raising children to simply be good. As born-again believers in Jesus Christ, my wife is born again, I'm born again, I'm a follower of Jesus, she's a follower of Jesus. Our responsibility is to not make sure they do right things. 
Our responsibility is to not make sure that they do good things or to be a good person. Our responsibility as a follower of Jesus is to help them become godly. See, there's a difference. The culture can raise children to be good. Phil Donahue can raise kids to be good. Oprah Winfrey can raise kids to be good. Judge Judy could raise kids to be good. But followers of Jesus, if we've been entrusted with children, our responsibility is to help them to become godly. Only Christian fathers and mothers can raise godly children. So finally, empower your family through prayer and the word. Now, I love this passage of scripture. And if I go long anywhere, it's going to be on this pit, uh, scripture right here. That's a warning for Joseph and the band. Psalm 127, verse 3 through 5, the author wrote this about children. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gate. I love that imagery. I love that imagery. Now, if you're not following me, if you're not following along, Psalm 127, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward for him. They are like arrows in a warrior's hand. Now, the writer is not referencing their shape. He's not saying children are skinny with pointy little heads. Okay, what is the purpose of an arrow? Does, does an arrow do any good when it's just sitting in the quiver? No, right? The arrow is designed to do what? Fly through the air, right? Whether it hits its target or not, the arrow is designed to fly. Everything about the arrow is designed to fly. But how does an arrow fly? People don't pick up the arrow and throw it. They could. That would be one way. But that's not how they were designed. What propels the arrow? Man, you're right. So follow me. If I had a bow and arrow in my hand, I would have to take... I'm right-handed. I think this is right. So I would have to take, pull the arrow back with my right arm, right? That's the only way that that arrow is going to leave this bow. Our children are our arrows. God is the bow, the bow of Jesus Christ. He has given us those arrows to pull back. How do we pull our children back? How do we get them ready through the prayer through the word by calling out to god for them by praying over our children by asking god to bless our children bless them father give them wisdom show them grace give them a godly husband give them a hunger for your word by calling out to god by teaching them his word our responsibility is to pull them back let them get ready to be released and aimed in the right direction. And how do we do that? Through the power of prayer and through the word. We pull our children back through prayer. We pull our children back through the word. And then when it's time, we release them and we let those suckers fly. <laughs> and we let them go and trusting them to God believing wholeheartedly that we've done everything that we could through power of prayer and through the word that they are going to fly in the direction that God intended them to fly in. And that means doctors and lawyers and nurses and all that stuff are great things, but that may not be God's plan for your child. What if God calls your child to be a missionary in an Islam country? Are you going to let him go? Absolutely if you're a follower of Jesus, you want your children to fly. You want your children to advance God's kingdom. You want your children to make a difference, to make disciples. That's what you want as a follower of Jesus. Let God use them for how he has wired them and shaped them and release them and encourage them and pay their rent from time to time. <laughs> but love on those children. Our next steps include empowering our children through the power of prayer and by teaching them God's word, modeling Jesus in our homes. That is how we raise godly children. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you been trying to influence your child or the unsaved child in your home to go the direction that you want for their life? 
Or have you been trying to influence them to go the direction that God wants for their life? Are you trying to relive your childhood through them? Are you giving them freedom to be the person that God has called them to be? Are you allowing them to be unique? My prayer is that you would allow your prayers and your word and your instruction about God to be sufficient and let God take care of the rest. Let him shape them and mold them. You be the dad. You be there. You be present in their lives. Now, to all the daddies who have messed up, you hear this message and say, I didn't do any of that. To all the daddies that feel like you've messed up from a son who was messed up, let me just tell you, forgiveness is powerful. And maybe you just need to take some time to give yourself a little bit of grace and thank God for his and make an apology if you need to, to pick up the phone, to write a letter, to send an email, to send a Snapchat. And let them know how much you regret things you didn't do or things you did and love on them. There's hope. There's hope for you. There's hope for your children. God takes broken our broken families and he, he still turns them into something beautiful, doesn't he? And so we're, we're thankful for God's grace. Have you ever thought about what you would do if you were no longer here for your family? Have you pointed them to Jesus enough? If you were no longer here, if God forbid something would happen to you in your life today, have you pointed them to Jesus enough that they would be able to say, my daddy, my mama, they loved Jesus and they gave me hope and I found hope in the God's word and I know it's true because I saw their lives change as a result of following God. Have you done enough? If you were given a second chance, would you do it differently? If you were given a second chance at raising your kids, would you do it differently? If you were given a second chance with the kids that are in your home today, what would you do differently? Well, Joseph Pfeiffer, who led worship here just a moment ago, has a video we're going to hear. And in that video, Joseph encountered a life-threatening situation that made himself ask that very question, Am I going to get a second chance? And what will I do with it? Let's watch this video, then Joseph is gonna come and lead us in song. A few months ago, my wife Mandy and I were headed to the airport because we'd planned a small trip to Florida to be with some of our friends that were going through a really difficult time. And um, it was an early Friday morning, I remember, because it was our wedding anniversary, and we were really excited about that. And we were just talking about the lowlights and the highlights of, of that year as we, as we finally settled into our seats. And um, well, the plane began to taxi and was getting in the queue, getting ready to take off. And we heard the pilot say, flight attendants prepare for takeoff. And um, I was just looking out the window as we began to accelerate. And um, I noticed this piece of metal that just flew right by, which was very odd. And maybe three or four seconds later, the entire middle section of the plane just began screaming. It was just such a loud commotion. They were banging on the, the, the windows and everything else saying, stop the plane, stop the plane. And there was panic that was setting in all over the plane. The flight attendant uh, just ran up, looked out the window, said, oh my gosh, ran back to try to alert the pilot to, to what was happening. And we were just sitting there our lives in the balance, not knowing what was happening. And I'll never forget that look that, that Mandy gave me saying, what's going on? And I said, I don't know. And I grabbed her hand and we just began to pray. I was, I was looking out the window and we noticed shards of, of metal that were just flying off the engine covering. It's called the cowling. Man, I got my phone, turned it off airplane mode. I texted my, my dad and said, I don't know what's going on. Something's wrong with our plane. Um, if something happens, we love you. Tell our kids we love them and just, just please pray for us. He texted back, we're praying for the pilot. And that brought just such a, such a calm. I just really sensed the presence of God was with us. And the plane began veering to the left and, it was, and, then, and then it was circling and we finally heard the flight attendant saying, we don't know what's going on exactly. Um, we might have to make an emergency landing. The, the pilot says he thinks we can make it back to the airport. 
And man, all this happened so fast. So it was maybe 15 minutes and we finally <laughs> landed back in the airport. Everyone applauded when, when, when the pilot landed that we were greeted with fire trucks and ambulances. And we were just sitting there. Just could not believe what just happened. That night we decided to, to, to get a hotel. We, we got the best food that we could get and just began to celebrate our lives, celebrate that we had a second chance and we, we got a hotel and I woke up the next morning. I wrote all these words down and um, my, my wife and I, we just began to thank God for a second chance. And I just thought, man, I'm so glad that our story didn't end there. I'm so glad that we get another chance, another shot. I'm, I, I wanted to be a better father from all those moments that I was, and I wanted to be a better husband, and I wanted to be, um, I wanted to be closer to Jesus. I wanted a, a deeper prayer life, and all these things that you're saying, if, if I only had a second chance, and so I wrote this song, and I wanna share it with you guys this morning, and I, I hope it inspires you the way that this whole ordeal inspired us that um, you can be the spouse you want to be you can be the parent you want to be you don't have to wait for some kind of tragedy or you don't have to wait till it's too late you can make a choice now to to just be close with Jesus and, and make all those decisions that that you need to make now make things right now and um, we're just grateful to have a second chance I want you to do a favor do me a favor take your fingers place them here on your wrist if you have a pulse, God has given you a second chance. Inside your bulletin, you're going to find our Next Steps card. The squares that are there are not just for design. They're not just bullet points. They are actually boxes that you can check and say, God, I will take this next step in my family's life. Maybe you're not yet a follower of Jesus. There's a box there for you to check. Maybe you've not yet been baptized, there's a box for you to check. Maybe it's to spend time with your family at practices or at the dinner table. Maybe it's a family game night or maybe it's singing worship songs with your children and your wife. Maybe it's a time of a weekly time of the word. What will your next step be with your family? These boxes are for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for changing lives. Thank you, God, that you give us second chances and third chances, and you show us unending grace. Thank you. Father, we love you. Thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name.